Good evening. Welcome to the Glasov Gang. Tonight, a very special guest, Dr. Mark Dury, a theologian, human rights activist, pastor of an Anglican church, and an associate fellow at the Middle East Forum. And he is back by popular demand. And tonight we are discussing our fear of Islam and our surrender to Islam, on certain levels anyway. What I want to get to tonight, first of all, Mark Dury, thank you so much for returning to the Glasoff Gang. It's great to be with you again, Jamie. Thank you. Mark, let us begin with our fear of and surrender to Islam. And the context that I mean that in is obviously on several realms. There's a tremendous fear of speaking the truth in our society, and it's now literally been disallowed. I want to talk to you a little bit about something you raised with me in our correspondence over the last few days. There is a tend and befriend dynamic that's occurring between Islam and the infidel. And we're going to use Bergdahl's father as the hook and example to this phenomenon. Why don't I give it to you now? Yes, it's very interesting when Bergdahl, uh, Bergdahl's father made that statement alongside President Obama. He began by saying, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, that is uh, saying in the name of Allah the merciful, the beneficent. He, he used a classic Islamic dedication uh, ritual. Um, and he indicated uh, really in his language that he's been put a lot of effort into studying and identifying with the culture, you know, the culture of the people that had been holding his son. And many people were disgusted by this. They thought, why, what is he doing? Um, and, but as I was watching it, I thought, this is a classic illustration of, uh, of the tend and befriend response. Um, the, the, in the 1932 or so, people said when an animal is stressed, it can fight or it can flee. It's the fight or flight options. But there's the third option, which is instead of fleeing, instead of fighting, is to try to become a friend of the source of your stress. And, and I think that's, that's what he's demonstrating, really, in the way he's responded over the years. And Mark, in many respects, this is just a reflection, a symbol, it's metaphorical to what the West is doing overall in terms of Islam, correct? It's true. It's a, it's a fear-driven response. Anyone who's had, a do say, a dog knows that if, if the dog feels that you're angry with them, they might not snarl, they might start licking your feet. Um, it's the way they, they, they deal with the stress. And... It's a common human response to stress. So you, you see it in the Stockholm Syndrome, pe people who are captives identifying with their kidnappers or abused women identifying with their abusers. Uh, and I think it's actually a very profound psychological response, a deep kind of visceral response uh, to situations of fear. So people can feel fear, experience it, not name it, not be able to identify it clearly, and to be conditioned by it uh, to, to the point that they will tend and befriend. So they try and work out ways of doing favors for or loving or being kind to the source of the fear in order to reduce its danger to them. Well, it, it, absolutely. I mean, after every single terrorism attack, the solutions that the media and our leadership are now bringing up are precisely the causes of the terrorism. So what I mean by that is, let's say with the Tsarnaevs, uh, right away the media and the government start responding because this was a problem in many respects of quote-unquote diversity. But the way that we respond, our society responds, is the problem of diversity now needs a solution and it's more diversity. It's absolutely true. The, the, um, you have to resolve the stress. Something needs to be done about it. No response is not an option. And fighting is apparently unavailable, the people's ideology or their worldview, or they just don't know how to resist. Or labeling um, Islam for what it is. Now that's, that increases the fear. That will just escalate the, the sense of challenge. I mean, one of the problems that I've found in, in talking about Islam is that when you identify some of the theological teachings of Islam, the principles, they just don't know where to go with it. They, they don't know what the solution is. So don't tell me about the problem unless you've got the solution. So... Tend and befriend is to just to deny that there is a um, that there is a problem in the first place. And it, the thing to understand about it, it's a very deep 
psychological response. It's, it overrides uh, mental processing. It overrides rationality. It's a, it's a decision, in a way, of the soul that's arrived at without rational reasoning. You construct the reasoning upon that response. You justify it. You draw in reasons. Ignore evidence as required. Construct your worldview around this response. The response itself is more powerful than, the, than the, any, any intellectual overrides. Thank you, Mark. And just to sum up this, what we're talking about here in our correspondence, you know, you talked about trauma bonding in terms of, let's say, sexual abuse. There's an emotional dependency created between an abuser and a victim. And that in times of trauma, the abused people have a greater need to be cared for and to attach to others. And so, That's true. And so in this dilemma where we're the infidels, we're the Kafirs, and we're being assaulted and abused, terrorism is being inflicted on us. In the West, in terms of our elites now in our media, the disposition, the impulse is to try to embrace Islam even more, to try to embrace our abuser even more, rather than tell the truth about him and put up a fight. It's true. Uh, when you're in trauma, you need someone to connect to, someone to attach to. And if you've got no one else, the abuser is the best person. And you need someone powerful, someone who will make a difference in your situation. And who could be more powerful than the source of, of your trauma and the source of your stress? Um, and then what happens is that when people's worldviews are already damaged and not really coherent, uh, they build their worldview around that. So then you begin to silence critics of Islam because mm -hmm. that threatens your tendon befriend response. It makes that unsafe and it makes it a dangerous response. So you silence people in order to allow you to continue to tend and befriend and you deny evidence that's, uh, that's in conflict with your, your, your worldview and your understanding. I mean, it's, it's a very well-known uh, situation when, when people are enslaved uh, uh, they they might experience terrible trauma, but normally after a while they have to ad identify with their owners because there's no other way really for them to survive. And uh, uh, women, when they're kidnapped and raped and they're compelled to be part of a new family against their will, um, very often they they actually they they bond with the person that's caused them trauma. They've got no choice but to do that in order to survive. It's such a deep visceral response. But what's really incredible is that this response grounded in, in hormonal responses in kind of very deep uh, programming of, of us as, as living beings is being played out at a macro level across nations, across civilizations. That's, that's really quite uh, uh, incredible to see it working at that level. And you know, Mark, it, it's, it's, it's just incredible and sickening uh, for me myself when I, when I confront leftists and run into leftists how they pose as humanitarians, and yet they're the most heartless and callous people I have ever met. And I'll give you an example in terms of what we're discussing. Mark, when I, when I see a picture of Axa Parvez, the 16-year-old girl that was murdered by her Muslim father and brother in Toronto uh, for not wearing the veil and for being too westernized, and I say to a leftist, this is a 16-year-old girl suffocated by her Muslim father and brother for being too westernized. You would think that the humanitarian person with compassion, that the first instinct would be to say, oh, this is horrible, poor girl, who did it and what forced the person and what inspired or sanctioned this behavior? But their first response is not that. Their first response is always, not all Muslims do that, not all Muslims do that. But I never said that all Muslims do that. Why, and, but their first response is always something that, that lacks in compassion and lacks in empathy uh, to the victims of Isla Islamic Jihad and Islamic gender apartheid, etc. It's tragic, isn't it? And uh, the idea that the West could be sleepwalking into Sharia and condemning Muslim women to live under, uh, under conditions that are really unregulated through Sharia courts in countries like the UK you, you have to, it does destroy your compassion to go down, to go down that track. But I think it's really interesting, Jamie, if, 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 in a situation where a woman is being abused in a, in a relationship and she's being very cruelly treated, she'll often justify the abuse against herself. Um, like, uh, I, I was stupid or he's really a kind man, but I have to be careful and not make mistakes and he really means well and, 
and so on. And, and it's absolutely terrifying for them sometimes to acknowledge that they are themselves not the problem, it's the other person. But you could equally say that they lack compassion for themselves, that their ability to say about themselves, I deserve better, um, he shouldn't be treating me like that, this is wrong, that, that ability to have self-compassion has been destroyed in the abuse. And um, so it's, it's not just compassion for others, it's compassion for ourselves as a nation, for our children. You know, uh, the, the tolerance of, of abuse in many levels in our society with Islam is, is really, uh, really quite disturbing and, and it's, it's worth staying awake and thinking about, that's for sure. Absolutely, Mark, and it, it, exactly, you know, the, the people that I've encountered and know in my life that I know are in situations where they are abused, the way that they identify with and defend their abuser is exactly what we're seeing today in terms of how many infidels and kafirs in our own society defend the abuser, which is Islam. Let's move over to another subject, precisely part of this now, in terms of female genital mutilation. I spend a large portion of my life fighting on behalf of the victims of Islamic female genital mutilation. And it's very interesting that whenever this subject is brought up, 6,000 girls a day that this is done to, over 90% of them uh, in Muslim environments and contexts because of Islamic theology. When I raise this, instead of the leftist and the, the um, indoctrinated um, believer in our society that's um, in, intoxicated with this utopian virus, the first response is again, oh, not all Muslims do this, but I didn't say that all Muslims do this. Why are you not interested in the Muslims that do do this and the ideology that sanctions it and inspires it? Why don't you take it from here in terms of we discussed, there's a movie out now, The Honor Diaries, where an interviewee actually said something interesting about FGM. Yes, uh, Kanta Ahmed, uh, one of the women being interviewed in the Honor Diaries, uh, said that female genital mutilation is not advanced in Islam in any way, shape or form. It does not appear in the Quran, but it's been adopted by Muslim societies. And also, Ayan Hirsi Ali's uh, foundation website says that, that female genital mutilation has no foundation in Islamic scripture or law. And uh, I have a, a tremendous respect uh, for uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali and also for the Honor Diaries. It's a fantastic uh, video about the plight of women um, who are abused uh, under Islamic conditions. But both those statements are absolutely and categorically false. Uh, it's not in the Quran, but it's in the traditions of Muhammad, in the, the teachings, the sayings of Muhammad, that there are multiple references to female circumcision. There are uh, references that come from his young wife, Aisha, who speaks about details of sexual intercourse which refer to the circumcised parts. There are, there are hadiths that speak about circumcision of men and women indiscriminately and describe it as, as polite or a, a part of decency, as being a decent human being. And there are also traditions that specifically refer to female genital mutilation. There's one of Muhammad that said that you shouldn't cut too deep uh, when you do female genital mutilation. And based on these um, these traditions that are well attested in the teachings of Muhammad, Islamic legal schools have developed rulings on female circumcision. In one school, the school that applies in Egypt and in Indonesia, the Shafi'i school, it is obligatory. And uh, there is an Islamic textbook that said it's obligatory by cutting out the clitoris. In another school, it's highly recommended, and in the other schools, it's permitted. Um, so that the evidence for that is absolutely crystal clear. It's it's not uh, d really disputable. You could dispute how you interpret it, but it's definitely part of Islam. Um, yes, not all societies that practice female genital mutilation are Islamic. There are non-Islamic groups that do it, but within Islam, there is a, a there is a case to be made that it's an Islamic practice. It's absolutely clear that Muhammad's wife Aisha was was circumcised. It's become part of Islam. It's as Islamic as male. Uh, a circumcision is, um, and that, that really amazes me that um, that groups, uh, people that are, are are very fearless and courageous in in being critical of bad aspects of the religion, 
uh, nevertheless seem to be willing to accept this this lie about about such an important thing that affects apparently about two million women in the world ha have their genitals mutilated each year I mean women and girls and so this is not a small human rights issue it's a huge issue yet people who've devoted their lives and risked their lives to fight for the freedom of women in these contexts are, are not speaking the truth about it and that's got to make you ask questions like what is going on here what are the processes that condition these kinds of responses and uh, very much connected to tend and befriend and a psychological slavery but once again when it comes to the left that controls our boundaries of discourse young Muslim girls and the barbarity that they suffer all of that can be sacrificed on the altar of utopian ideals which includes that all cultures and religions are equal mark we have about two minutes left what's been on your mind my friend well I, I've been uh, thinking a lot about these um, these uh, these psychological pressures that we're facing and, and how to be free uh, from them um, how can you be truthful while also being compassionate uh, how to hold those together in a in a, in a powerful way um, I'm looking for opportunities to, to, to challenge and, and have, really have communication conversations uh, with the people in all the different places that they're at in, in wrestling with that. Um, I, so it's uh, just living that out day by day and finding, finding leverage really to raise these issues with people. Mark, in terms of how the left now the permit, uh, controls the permitted boundaries of discourse in our culture, do you find yourself marginalized and demonized and coming into these problems as a brave truth teller on this issue? I've had a, a lot of, um, I've found a lot of open doors really. Um, yes, I've had some hate mail from time to time, but my experience is a lot of people are sitting on the fence. They are not happy, they feel stressed and they want options. And if you can uh, provide them with a coherent worldview uh, that enables them to maintain their humanity and their compassion, their dignity, while also being truthful, uh, they can be very relieved. And, and uh, so I've, I've had a lot of open doors. Maybe it's partly being in Australia. I think Australia's been a good place to talk about these issues. Uh, you've got lots of challenges in the US and in, and in parts of Europe. But um, uh, I've, I've had support in the church that I work for, for example, and that's, that's, been, that's been terrific. So I've, I've made lots of friends, <laughs> I think, along the way. Absolutely, but Mark, what I'm also referring to is the higher literary culture, the media culture. For instance, when are we going to see you on Anderson Cooper on CNN? When are we going to see you on MSNBC? When are they going to have a good talk with you at the New York Times and Washington Post and put it on the front page? You would think that this is a serious issue. Well, that would be the day. Um, and I've had a few openings in Australian media, but uh, at times when I've come to the U.S. and sought to have those opportunities in the U.S., that hasn't happened. So I hope that happens. But look, even, even the people who are local, the local people in the U.S. that could be on those shows are not there when they should be. I think the journalists need to make a decision that the conversation has to be had, and it needs to be a real conversation, not um, a manufactured one. And when they decide to allow that to happen, uh, that it's in the public interest, that it's, it's not helpful to remain silent about the mutilation of women or all the other issues, uh, then, then, then things will change. But as of now, the, the forces that we are discussing that control our culture are more interested in tend and befriend vis-a-vis -vis Islam. Mark, the, the, fear, the fear is conditioning that. That's true. Yeah. Mark Dury, thank you so much for coming on the Glazov Gang, and thank you so much for being such a brave truth teller in our modern world today as we face these terrible threats. Thank you, Jamie. It's a privilege to be with you. And I hope to see you again. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining this week of the Glazov Gang. We'll see you next week. Good night.